life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details, and survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Hello. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Sunday of the Dead, where we talk all about The Walking Dead with much spoilers. There will be spoilers. Mm-hmm. I'm Lainey. I'm Marshall. We're here for you today. Corey is not here today. But we are going to talk about Season 3, Episode 2, Sick. And I don't think it means that sick. I don't think that's what it means. No. No. So a little bit about this episode. It was directed by Billy Gearhart, written by Nicole Beatty, and the original air date was October 21st, 2012. Right around here, I've noticed that Wikipedia and some of the other sources I'm getting my information from, they aren't as standard as a lot of our other episodes where it says, here's what the viewership is, here is you know, who it was written by, directed by. So I have to kind of piece this together in other ways. So if it seems like I'm not giving you as much information, that's probably why. Sick was watched by an estimated 9.5 million viewers, which was down from the season premiere when it broke several records, when it reached 10.9 million viewers. So it is starting to decline a little bit. Uh, I can see why. I mean, there was stuff that happened in the last episode, but I wouldn't say that they were like, must watch cliffhangers yeah i mean when we ended there were five dudes in a cafeteria like (laughs) you know who are these guys Mm. and then there was the whole thing with herschel's leg so that was probably the most climactic thing that happened we pick up where we left off with the group tending to herschel's legs we see there's a menu in the cafeteria i couldn't quite read what was on the menu no and next to the menu are five men. Now, I will say that in the comics, there are only four men and uh, their their names, some of the names are the same, some are not the same. Uh, I tried to kind of piece together who was whom. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the comic portion of this episode. But let's talk about the new men. So the first one is a man named Big Tiny. As you can imagine, he is large, but probably... A little teddy bear guy. Yeah. Um, he is played by a man named Theodos. Sorry. Theodos <laughs> Crane? Yes. In real life, he is a professional mixed martial arts fighter and boxer. He was also in uh, Cloak and Dagger, the TV series, and he was in a TV series called Timeless that Marshall and I did watch. Yeah, yeah. We, we did. We did watch that. Mm-hmm. Next, we have a character named Tomas. Uh, Tomas uh, is played by Nick Gomez. He was in Jumanji, The Next Level, and the TV show Dexter. Next is Marquise Moore. His name, his character name is Andrew. He was in ATL and Chicago PD. Vincent M. Ward plays a character named Oscar. He was in True Blood and also the TV show The Connors. And lastly, we have Lou Temple, who plays Axel. He was in the movie Waitress and also The Devil's Rejects. Okay. He probably was the most recognizable to me as far as looks. I know I've seen him in other things. But anyway, we are in the middle of the standoff. Both groups are like, who are you? Well, who are you? What are you doing here? Well, what are you doing here? (laughs) That type of thing. Mm -hmm. Ironically, there is a poster on the wall that describes emergency first aid. Yeah. Yeah. Because they just had to do some of that. Wouldn't have been really handy if they looked at that marker. <laughs> yes. What to do in case somebody got bit on the leg by somebody with a lot of slubber. Right. Glenn finds a rolling cart with a flat top, so they decide they're going to put Herschel on it, wheel him out of the cafeteria so they can get away from the new guys, but also yet put him in a more secured place. Mm-hmm. But they're leaving the new guys in the cafeteria, and it pans over, and then there's Herschel's leg on the floor. <laughs> and the new guys are looking into their like. What just happened here? <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> and you're hit with the intro. <laughs> and you know this isn't the this isn't the first th- this is the first time, but not the last time that you know a leg is left around where there's something being eaten. So then we go back to the prison where they are wheeling Herschel back through the hallways to C Block. 
Um, and then the guys are like looking at him, go like, oh, no, we, we out of here now. <laughs> We've been in this prison for like a long time. We're out of here. Um, I noticed that someone has legit hung box fans on the walls in the hallway. Um, instead of like those really large circle industrial fans, uh, there it is a box fan that you can get for like $15 at Walmart, okay? I'm just thinking, are their funding not up to par there in this situation? Yeah, but at the same time, my own work has very similar fans installed hanging from the ceiling in the warehouse, and <laughs> we're not allowed to use them. Why not? I don't know. So they then installed another set of fans, which are a lot more industrial, that we're not allowed to plug in. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So anyway, they bring Herschel into C Block. Scott Wilson, the actor who plays Herschel, said he often fell asleep while shooting the scenes where Herschel is unconscious. And why wouldn't he? <laughs> <laughs> because your eyes are closed, you might as well. <laughs> I'm getting paid to take a nap. Exactly. So in, usually, Herschel is the doctor in the situation, even though he's a vet. He is the doctor in the situation. But it looks like Carol has some knowledge that she has learned from Herschel. Herschel has been prepping her for the baby's birth. So she just takes charge right away and is like, we need to do this, go get this, you know. At this point in her story, Carol has kind of gone from being the, well, I'm the housewife she is the, in D&D parlance, a commoner. She is now going and being like, well, what kind of character class do I want to be? Do I want to be the cleric? Do I want to be the fighter? Eventually, she is going to settle on the rogue, and we are all happy about that. Right. There is a big discussion about whether they should cauterize the wound. Uh, they decide they're not. They're going to keep the leg dressed and just let it heal on its own. Mm -hmm. Daryl, though, is smart. He takes watch at the open door because he's waiting for the prisoners who probably followed them. Mm -hmm. And he's right. Some of the prisoners want to leave. Some want to stay. Especially because technically they were there first. Yeah. Uh, now, I want to bring up that while Rick lists off all of these things that are no longer around for modern living in this scene, he's like, yeah, we, we don't have power, we don't have hospitals, we don't have running water, none of these things. He does not mention that they no longer have Amazon. Amazon is prepared for a zombie apocalypse to occur. And if you don't believe me, look up Amazon Web Services Terms and Conditions, paragraph 42.10, Acceptable Use in Safety Critical Systems. By the way, this episode was not sponsored by Amazon. So what he's saying is there is a legit paragraph about an apocalypse. A in, zombie apocalypse. A zombie directly. apocalypse in the Amazon acceptable use of safety critical systems terms and conditions okay no joke go look it up it's mm -hmm. there but the prisoners don't necessarily believe them in saying that there's nothing out there at this point t-dog comes to give daryl some backup rick tasks glenn to be there as support if herschel dies he needs to be there for maggie and beth and probably a lot of the women, too, who are probably going to be very upset when if, if and when Herschel dies. Carl is on door duty. And he takes this very seriously. He's like, he, like, as soon as Rick goes through the door, Carl just dashes and mm -hmm. closes the door right behind him and locks it. Right. Also, I want to bring up the keys that they are using. They are legitimate prison keys. I have actually, in my work as a framer, I have framed prison keys. And it looked exactly like that. Oh, wow. They are hefty mothers. It is revealed that those prisoners have been there for 10 months. There was a riot, and a guard locked them in the cafeteria for anywhere from 292 to 294 days. There's some discussion about exactly how long. I say these guys must be hurting for some vitamin D about this point. Yep. Uh, so they go outside to see what exactly is happening out there because, again, they don't believe Rick. And as they're walking outside, they're all like, ah, oh, sunlight. <laughs> I've been in that dark hole for a while. I think the prisoners themselves are starting to see that this group can do some real damage. Like, they didn't really tell them that, you know, the group did the walker killing on the outside they said you know we killed these people off but the prisoners still think this is kind of a small amount of people that did this 
They start to say they can stay outside the prison. But they're, they're saying that the survivors are saying, can stay out there. Stay the survivors. Outside. The prisoner is saying this about the survivors. But um, I'm thinking maybe you just don't get it. Um, these these uh, this group that has infiltrated your prison, they just killed fifty zombies. There are five of you. You are a little outnumbered in mm. this situation. So Axel, I think. Again, it starts to be like, uh, okay, let, let's calm down, guys. Let's talk about this. You know, Tomas seems to say that they can take out another cell block because in his eyes, if Rick, T-Dog, and Dar- Daryl can take out the bodies, they can do that. Yeah. But Tomas doesn't know it wasn't just three guys that did all of this. Yeah. Okay. Rick offers to clear out the block in exchange for half the food. But he says, if you come near us, I will kill you. I actually am kind of against Rick on this one a little bit. Keeping these guys as allies is a really good idea. Chances are, if they head out on the road, these guys might join up with the bandit gang that Dave, Tony, and Randall came from. And that's a bad thing. We don't want them to inform the bandits about... Uh, about the jail, if the bandits are still out there. Well, that's true, but I think in reality, Rick just doesn't trust them. Oh, he really overall. doesn't. Overall, in prison C block, they are trying to stop the bleeding from the legs and say we need to find some crutches. Carol turns to Lori and she's like, "Are like you're worried?" And then Lori goes, "Do I look worried?" No, Lori, you look manic. <laughs> that this is not a good look on you. According to the cast members, the prison beds were actually more comfortable than they looked. Which makes sense if Herschel was falling asleep. <laughs> yeah. Now we see the group in the prison cafeteria. So they are looking to raid the pantry. So we got the, the five prisoners and we've got um, some of the people from Rick's group. Oscar says they tried to take the doors off. But if they made a peep, those freaks would be lined up outside the door. I'm making this point because later on something happens that totally negates Mm -hmm. this statement. Um, Rick, you can tell, is ready for any kind of whatever happens here. He has his hand on his gun just in case. Inside this pantry, I can see oats, breadcrumbs, and there's something on the shelf in a crate that's labeled Big L. It says U.S. number one Big L California potatoes. Oh, gotcha. I can also see green beans, spices, tomatoes, corn, and soybean oil. Rick opens the freezer and gets pummeled by stink. So they have been using it as a bathroom and there probably isn't ventilation because it's a freezer. This also happened in the comics. Prison Block C, uh, we return to Herschel and he is wheezing. Maggie tries to prepare herself that he could die. She says, he can't even walk and all we do is run. I'm thinking peg leg with casters on it so he can roll. That would be great, but he'd probably fall over, to be honest. He would also need some kind of, like... Switch to turn it on and off. to, like, keep him, you know... Anyway. She goes to check on Beth, and Beth is keeping herself busy by fixing Herschel's pants. She is sewing and cutting the leg off one of them so that he can just put his leg in there and it doesn't have to be dragging on the ground. Mm-hmm. Seems pretty smart to me. She's preparing, you know. Maggie tries to give Beth a dose of reality and Beth basically is like, why, why do you have to be like this? Like, you just need to have faith, really, that, that this is going to happen. Do you see how much of a switch she's had? Mm-hmm. In eight months, she went from being practically suicidal to being... Why so negative? Just making the best of it. T-Dog and Rick show up with food. Lots of cans of food. Just canned food. There's like a bag of something. Corn. Yeah. And then T-Dog is carrying like two full boxes. And the boxes are labeled ACK Foods Inc. And this is a real company. They do produce food. But they only produce food based on tomatoes. Tomato paste, tomato sauce, and tomato ketchup. That's it. It's all they make. Wow. All right. Rick gives Glenn his handcuffs to put on Herschel just in case. And from the way that Herschel is 
acting and the way that he's he's having difficulty breathing stuff like that I feel like Herschel needs a transfusion like right. he lost so much blood when they hacked off the lower part of he blood. lost more blood than Carl lost when he mm-hmm. was shot and they gave Carl quite a few transfusions yeah I don't know why they aren't here that seems kind of weird well it may be because Carol may not know how to do a transfusion at this but point. Rick and Lori do they were mm-hmm. sitting right there when it happened they know yeah. how to do a transfusion Oh, I'm sure Maggie knows how to do a transfusion. She should. Yeah. So Rick explains the situation to Lori, who is, as usual, unhappy about the situation. Rick says there are options uh, for these prisoners that they have found. They either live there with them or they kill them. Mm-hmm. That's a basic options. Lori says she doesn't think there is malice in Rick's heart and that he isn't a killer because Rick has only killed to protect the group. Yes, that is right. We have been tracking this. And this line that she says to him is really important for this whole episode, I feel. Because after she says that, she says, do what you feel needs to be done Mm -hmm. to protect this group. That's it. Do what you got to do. And this line actually gets repeated throughout the episode. Right. The prisoners and a part of Rick's group decide they're going to start clearing uh, the prison and the area in which the prisoners are going to live. Tomas questions why does he need a blunt instrument weapon when he has a gun? So Daryl explains, um, you have to be quiet here, dude. All right. So earlier when Oscar says... They didn't take the doors off because they had to be quiet, because if they didn't, the walkers would come get them. Leads me to believe that Tomas knew exactly why they needed to be quiet and why he couldn't use a gun in this But he didn't really care, because he's far too much into using guns. He has become the Andrea of Mm -hmm. gun craziness, right? Also, I want to bring up, he has a revolver. His gun has six shots. And that's it. So you really don't want to use those unless you have to. Yeah. So they make a plan saying Daryl and T-Dog are going to go in the front of this group. And Rick and Oscar, I think it's Oscar, is in the back. It could be Andrew. I was having trouble saying who was who. Back at the C block, Maggie asks for a minute alone with Herschel. She says to him that she is giving her blessing. And if he needs to die... He can die. That they'll be he okay. He doesn't have to fight. Yeah. Um, for some reason, I put down, she has really nice teeth right now. I think I was thinking that because I'm like, how long does it take for teeth to start decaying if they don't have dentistry? And that kind of depends on your sugar intake, I think. Um, a lot of your, a, a good amount of your teeth, tooth decay does come from sugar intake and then also from bacteria. Commercial toothpaste has a shelf life of two years. But then again, that's just the fluoride. The fluoride starts breaking down in the toothpaste. So that's just the stuff that's, uh, I don't know, trying to control your mind uh, and and make you sheep for the shadow government. So, uh, you know. (laughs) I believe it's called tea dazzle. Tea dazzle. That's what they call it in Parks and Rec, tea dazzle. I agree, but still... Even with brushing and flossing, you can still have bad teeth. Mm-hmm. I I feel like the people in this show, their teeth is just, it's just too good. Especially considering the fact that they're growing potatoes, tomatoes. These are things, carbs, acid, they break down your teeth. Yeah. Granted, they're not having their morning coffee anymore right now. Though that probably starts up again later. Uh, but still. Yeah. White teeth. Okay. Enough of that. Uh, They are still clearing the prison. It looks like it's going to be D-Block. But we're not there yet. As the group comes around the corner, they see a few walkers coming at them. So Al, it's like this really funny scene where the group is just staring at the walkers. And all of a sudden, as a group, the prisoners start screaming like this battle cry and run up to the walkers and just start wailing on him and Rick and the rest of the group were kind of look at each other like um, oh okay this was probably a mistake oh, okay. and when, when they do that it reminds me of the scene from Hook kill the lawyer kill the lawyer <laughs> 
but unfortunately, the prisoners are not taking headshots. They are only going for the middle of the walker. Because prison shiv skills are of no use in the z -poc. <laughs> So again, Rick in there and the rest of the group look at each other like, Okay. <laughs> How are we going? We, we need to take them back to basics here, right? Yeah. Uh, in the C block, Glenn is winding Herschel's watch, and it says it's 10.55. Probably in the morning, Maybe, yeah. Carl has found medical supplies from the infirmary. He says, there's only two walkers there. It's no big deal. And everyone's like, you went by yourself? Carl? Like, what? Yeah, he's, he's like... He's the a, new stealthy Glenn. Like, what do you want? And when, you can see when he walks back into a C block, he's using his silenced pistol. He's mm -hmm. actually got it drawn. So that's what he used. So, yeah, he could totally take those two zombies out without anybody noticing yeah. and not being in any danger. So Lori yells at Carl because of what happened to Herschel. And there were more people around when it happened to Herschel. It wasn't just one person. So Carl is starting to get really hot under the collar, and he dis disrespects Lori by saying, Get off my back. Because in his mind, he thought he was going to come back this hero because he did this to help Herschel, and now he's getting yelled at. So then Beth reprimands Carl about it. Uh, Carl, not looking too good in front of your crush right now when your crush has to yell at you mm -hmm. for that. So then Carl is really ashamed, and he, just, he runs away. He's just like, no. All right, let's go back to them clearing the prison. We just tend to be bouncing back and forth here, okay? Uh, Daryl instructs the prisoners how to kill. Says you have to go for the brain, not the middle, the brain. Rick says they need to stay in formation. So the walkers start coming at them and they start killing them again. But Big Tiny gets a little scared and he starts backing off. Mm -hmm. And as he's backing up, uh-oh, there's a walker coming from behind him. Tiny tries to kill him, but he doesn't. And I noticed that the walkers have handcuffs, and he rips his hand out of the handcuffs. That's, like, so gross. Yeah. Rick comes to help, and then Tomas gets gun-happy and makes too much noise. And he wastes half of his gunshots. I wish I had been tracking the bullets, but I hadn't in this point. I mean, it's not going to be too much of an important thing for too long. Right. But, yeah, that gun had six shots. Now it's only got three left. Big Tiny got scratched by the walker on his back. It was kind of... Uh, well, okay, so I think he got scratched because I didn't... Re I watched, and the walker's head doesn't come close enough to his back to bite him. Mm -hmm. He, I can see the arm go, like, scritch down his back, kind of, like, at the segment of his arm and his back. And Big Tiny was just like, ow, but I never saw the head come. We'll talk about that later. Back at C-Block, Carol is doing a really good job of tending to Herschel. He's taught her a lot about basic medical care. Carol wants to talk to Glenn, but he's like, no, I need to stay where Rick told me to stay. I need to stay by Maggie. He is very protective of his little family, and after a lot of assurances, though, he goes with Carol. The women are like, dude, we're stronger than you think. You know, you're being protective, we get it, but go. But let's see how Big Tiny's doing, shall we? The wound is on his back, so they can't really amputate. After much arguing about what happens, to, well, how should they deal with him? Big Tiny's like, but you, but you can get rid of it. That other guy, what? And they're like, no, we can't amputate your back. Like, that's not how it works. <laughs> I got so, your back, bro. Yeah, so finally, Tomas just clubs Big Tiny. Like, kills him. This guy is so volatile. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the point where people are like, ooh, this guy is just not safe around us. And, you know, even then, Big Tiny, it, it, even if he got scratched and he's infected, mm -hmm. he has some time before the sepsis actually puts him down. Right. So you could still, like, let him fight. Put him on the front lines. Right. He's, what's going to happen? He's going to die faster? So, right. uh, and then once you once he actually does go down, you take out his brains and... He served a purpose. He helped you. You get to remember him as a hero. Obviously, Tomas is not that smart. No. Theodos Crane, the guy who played Big Tiny, loved the Big Tiny corpse model so much, he wanted to take the head and keep it up in his house. <laughs> Disturbing, but I also get it. Right? Outside the prison, Glenn and Carol are walking around. Carol says that one, and she points out this woman that's on the outside of the fence 
We come to find out that Carol wants to get a walker to practice a C-section since Herschel is incapacitated, may not pull out of it, and Lori is very much overdue. So she needs to practice her C-section skills so that she is confident in helping Lori if the time comes. And we can also see that Carol is using a piece of rebar as her personal weapon at this point before she actually gets her trench knife that is much more iconic for her later on. Uh, but rebar is a pretty solid choice for a personal weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, especially if you keep on watching movies, you see re rebar always ends up in someone's chest as soon as you see that rebar is there. Right, exactly. Um, but if you can sharpen one end, it's sturdy, it's easy to grip, and it's relatively lightweight. Mm -hmm. At this point, she's starting to become Dr. Carol, prison medicine woman. <laughs> yeah. Let's go back to inside the prison where Daryl and Rick are discussing how crazy Tomas looks. Crazy eyes. They find a laundry room. Now, this part actually happens in the comics as well. Rick tells Tomas to open the doors so they can have uh, to get into the cell block. But the doors are like double doors, and they're telling him just open one door. So that way, they open the one, the walkers can get out, and they can just pick them off as they're coming through the door. Andrew is kind of giving Rick the stink eye at this mm -hmm. point. The doors are stuck, and then when Thomas opens, he opens both doors, and lots of walkers pour out. So they're like, they're like, we only told you to open one. Well, I opened two. This He's happens. Like, stuff happens. Um, and so the walkers are beginning to attack. They're fighting the walkers, and as Thomas goes after a walker, he almost gets Rick. And almost hits him with I, whatever, it's like a bat, whatever it is that he's got. Yeah, it's like a bat with nails in it. And then he a, wicker, a walker comes at Tomas and Tomas throws it on Rick. And when you see Tomas making the swing, he isn't looking at the zombie. Right. He is actually looking at Rick. So yes. he's trying very hard to two in one and make it look like he just missed the walker and hit Rick. Right. But instead he hits the walker and misses Rick. Because he obviously wants to be the alpha in this group. He knows to take out Rick because he thinks that's the only way he can do this. So Rick and Tomas have a stare down. And in a moment I was not expecting and did not remember, Rick basically knives Tomas in the head. Boom. Done. Yeah. Not even really. They're just like looking at each other. Wham. Yeah. It, it was fast. Yeah. So Oscar comes after Rick, but Rick kicks him down. So Andrew runs off, but Rick goes after him. At this point in the room, there is only Oscar and Axel left. Andrew is outside in the yard where there are a lot of walkers running around. So Rick lets him go out and then shuts and locks the steel door to have them be outside together. And this is what you call lessons in short-range kiting, because this guy desperately needed to start trying to run around to lead them all in a circle uh -huh. so he could kill them off one by one. Right. Well, he doesn't make it, and Rick is inside th the prison, hearing him scream, knowing that he's a little bit regretful in the fact that he had to do this to somebody. Um, and the fact that Rick's actor name is Andrew mm. and this guy's name is Andrew I thought was kind of a funny mm. comparison and I feel like in this scene Rick's kind of starting to have this internal monologue and he's like asking himself after he closes the door and starts walking away he's like was this actually necessary well it was necessary for Tomas but it wasn't necessary for this guy right that's yeah that's what I mean like for Andrew was this actually a necessary kill or was this me being mean am I is this full of malice I'm I'm not really sure right. what is something wrong with me. I think that's the thoughts that are going on in his head. Let's check in with Herschel. Uh, Maggie is sitting next to him in the cell and his breathing stops. Lori starts to give him CPR. And in a very dramatic moment, Herschel grabs Lori's head as he wakes up. And it looks like he's about to go after her and then he falls back asleep. And as you pan back, you see that Carl is standing there with a gun ready to shoot Herschel in the head. Mm -hmm. We join the other uh, prisoners that are left. Axel is pleading his case to Rick, saying that neither he nor Oscar were violent. Axel dealt drugs. Uh, it's actually probably more like possession of drugs. Right. But also we know that Axel is a 
is a biker. Like right. in in other media, we've seen that he is a biker. So that's probably where he like he has the drugs as possession. He does the drugs. Mm. Uh, yes and no. I, I I cannot remember what was in the comics, but they talk about it more there. And Oscar was just a breaking and entering. And Oscar says he has never pleaded for his life, and he isn't about to start now. And so then he says, you do what you gotta do. Mm -hmm. And that just hits Rick. And it's like, do I have to do this? Lori is telling me, like, I have to do what I need to do to keep the group safe. Is this going to keep them safe? Mm -hmm. So they take him back to D-Block. And as they walk in, they see that the prisoners that were in the D-Block originally were killed execution style coming out of their cells. They were laying in the cell doors just down and you can see that there are there's blood coming from their head. So these people got executed. Yes. So I think the guys that are in the cafeteria really made it out lucky. Yes. Because they could have been killed this way. Daryl apologizes about their friends. I thought that was really nice of him to say. And honestly. it is actually authentic. That like it's like he's he says, "I'm really sorry about your friends." Like he means it. Mm -hmm. T Dog gives them one final parting word of advice: take the bodies outside and burn them. Don't want them in here with you. Back at C Block, Rick and the group come back. Carl says Herschel stopped breathing, and Lori saved him. So Herschel starts to wake up again when Rick takes off the handcuffs. Herschel holds his hand out to Rick as thanks. This is really a kind of a hopeful thing in general. If Herschel can be saved from turning into a walker with an amputation, this means that other arm and leg wounds don't necessarily mean death. Mm -hmm. So this is like the second hope that they have in this whole situation. They're in a safer place. And technically, zombie bites don't mean you die. Unless it's on the trunk of the body. Exactly. Outside the prison, Carol is preparing to do a C-section on the walker. But we see that someone is watching Carol from outside the prison in the bushes. Ooh. Who is it? Is it Michonne and Andrea? Or is it someone we don't know about? Or is it someone we do know about, but we don't know that they're there? There's this walkway between a couple of the buildings in the prison, and Lori is standing out there kind of watching, meditating, whatever's running through her head, and Rick comes out to her. Rick says they're going to start cleaning tomorrow, and he doesn't think Lori is a bad mother. It was kind of like this whole, like, let me get this stuff off my chest situation. But Lori admits that she hasn't been a good wife to Rick. And then she's like, you can't really divorce in the apocalypse. Really? Like, I mean, uh, are we going to split our assets? <laughs> <laughs> right? That's a very good. Very good. I mean, like, you can make a commitment. Have a ceremony. You can have all of these things. But divorce in the end times isn't a legal issue anymore. It's literally just a decision that you choose not to be around the other person. That's all it is. Yeah. Rick makes the first move to making some improvement in the situation with Lori by giving her thanks. He isn't ready for more, but it took a lot to give her that. Then he starts to shut down. And I noticed that, like, this is a lot more from him reeling from the two men he just killed. Because when he shuts down, he does so immediately after she says, you're the one who acted fast. None of us would be here if you hadn't done what you did what you needed to do. Right. Again, repeating that same line. Neither of these kills that he made were actually in combat, but w one of them was definitely necessary because that person was a danger. Mm -hmm. The other person might not necessarily have been a danger, but was still on the fence, and he didn't kill either of them in actual combat. Well, okay, I kind of, I kind of get what you're saying, However, these deaths, in a way, mirror Dave and Tony. Mm -hmm. Because I believe mainly that Andrew, the killing of Andrew outside, was very similar to Dave and Tony because it was like the possibility that they could be an issue. 
Tomas was just an issue, oh, yeah. and you know he was at that stare down moment. Anybody could have died, really. Um, I think that was more of a Shane type kill, except he didn't know Tomas that well. But uh, so four again, you know, when you're talking about who kills the living to protect what's yours, Rick has now killed uh, five people. He mm-hmm. has the highest tally of uh, actual people killed. Four of which were strangers that he killed, and one of which was not. Mm-hmm. And you you noticed earlier that, and this was something that you noticed, um, you brought up before we started recording today, that whenever he tends to kill people that are strangers, he tends to kill them in pairs. But when he kills people that he knows, he kills them by themselves. Right. We'll see if that pattern continues to go. And while we kind of have this perception perception of like what he did and where and was it justified, in his own mind, he doesn't have the luxury of this outside opinion. So that's like why I think he's shut down in this moment. Mm-hmm. He's trying to figure out the morality that he's, right. he's exuding right now. Um, and then the episode ends here. This is kind of a weird place for an ending. Yeah. In my opinion. There wasn't like it wasn't very cliffhanger. It was just kind of like, hmm, okay. I think it would have been a better ending if they had ended with, like, had the scene right before they show Carol outside, and then you see Carol with mm. this mysterious person in the bushes, and that's where you ended the scene. Would have felt better to me. Yeah. So we kind of talked a little bit about who died, who kills the living. Tomas and um, Andrew were killed by Rick. Also, R.I.P. Big Tiny. We barely knew you, but you seemed like a teddy bear of a man. Let's talk about the title, Sick. Okay, so we have a lot of sick going on here. Herschel is sick. Uh, The prisoners could be a little sick in the head. Uh, Everyone is discovering that the world is sick. Any other sickness thoughts here? You go into that freezer and you'll get sick? Correct. In the comics... There's a couple issues, or not issues. <laughs> Get it? Issues. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the first thing is the men. Like we said, there were four in the comics, five in the episode. So here are, here's kind of how they differ. Uh, the men have their name changed. There is Dexter, who is a big guy and is now in the episode named Big Tiny. Axel, biker with a beard, kind of the same. Andrew is an ex-junkie. Uh, Tom, it's Thomas in the comics, Tomas in the show. He was a nerd in the comics. Um, now he's a Hispanic guy. Um, and in this case, like I said, there are five guys. Um, so they added Oscar. He was the new guy. In the comics, after they settle in a bit, Rick and Dale go to the farm to return with Herschel and family. Remember Dale? He was not supposed to die in the second season, but because he asked to be written off the show, uh, because he wasn't happy with how things were going behind the scenes with the production staff, he asked to be written off and killed. So, in the comics, he is still alive. They go to get Herschel and his family. Patricia and Otis are also still alive, but they are splitting up in the comic. So Otis stays at the farm to keep an eye on things while Patricia goes to the prison. There's this weird thing that happens in the comic uh, where Tyrese's daughter and her boyfriend, and I cannot remember if her boyfriend is one of those that came with them, with their part of the group when they met up with the larger group as a whole, or if the boyfriend was already part of the group and that's how they met, I don't know. But anyway, they they have sex in the comics and then they try to kill each other so that they can be zombies together forever. So they have this weird like sex zombie pact. Um, he ends up shooting her faster than she ends up shooting him and she dies and he doesn't. So at this point, they in the comics don't know that everyone has the zombie virus. So Rick tries to tell Reese, tell Reese, Rick tries to tell Tyrese that since she wasn't bitten, she won't turn. We know that's not true. Yeah. <laughs> right? So she uh, is in his lap and he's crying, Tyrese is crying over her and she ends up trying to bite him. So then the boyfriend shoots her again. And Tyrese, so overcome with emotions, strangles the boyfriend dead. So yes, they did end up together. No, they did not end up as zombies. But it was just a really bizarre plot twist. And I was like, 
Ah. Okay, then. Glad they didn't put that in the episode, because, wow. Yeah, that would have been awkward. Especially considering we haven't actually met Tyrese yet. Yes, Tyrese is not here yet. I'm, I'm, I am I like Tyrese. I'm looking uh, Tyrese forward to him great. showing up. I would have been okay if they had kept Big Tiny around, though. Yeah, probably would have been okay. And honestly, I know that these prisoners don't stay around that long anyway. Something happens to the other two. They're just to move the story along, I think. And I think Axel's kind of a prototype for a character that we see later on, Eugene, in that he's actually very intelligent, but nobody wants to listen to him because he talks too much. Right. Actually, Eugene gets to be a really sympathetic character mm-hmm. in these last couple of seasons as well, in 12 and... Or... 10 and 11. Is that where we are? He really does. So, But yes, I can see where you're going with that, for sure. I love Eugene as a character. Mm -hmm. I know that a lot of people hate him, and there's actually one video game that they did a version of it for Walking Dead, and Eugene is a major character in that Mm -hmm. game. And the people playing it hate him, because he goes (laughs) forever. Right. Um, There are a lot of things that come out in this season, too, that really explain some of the more questionable decisions that Eugene makes early on. So for your like, ew, Eugene, why? Um, Are explained in this season, actually, about why he did what he did. And it explains a lot. And I actually feel for him a lot. Um, But Mm -hmm. enough about that. That is the end of episode two for season three. Next week, we are going to talk about episode three walk with me thank you for listening to sunday of the dead and exploring each episode with us if you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com we want to bring you new and exciting geek worthy content if you want to help please consider donating to our coffee account the link is in the show notes and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Lainey on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time. Geek out.